I could have your attention. I'm uh, Michael Swetnam. I'm the CEO and the chairman of the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. And it's uh, my privilege to welcome you here to the Potomac Institute today for, uh, a, I hope, a lively discussion on the issues surrounding uh, Tehran and the bomb, as it is uh, characterized in the flyer that announces this session. I'm sure many of you know, or most of you in the audience, I hope know that the Potomac Institute is a not-for-profit uh, uh, institute in the Washington, D.C. area focused on the issues of science and technology and how they affect policy. We have been fortunate for a decade and a half to be the home of Professor Alexander's efforts to study terrorism and all aspects of terrorism as it affects mankind. He is the center of a worldwide organization of academics that look into the issues surrounding the use of terror and all of the things that cause it and what can be done to counter it. And Professor Alexander's organization has been responsible for a hundred academic books, literally thousands of articles, and hundreds of seminars like this that bring together learned people to discuss and hopefully uh, progress, uh, bring about progress on the issues of policy concerning some of the world's and mankind's toughest issues. Today is no uh, exception to that. Professor Yon Alexander has brought together some, uh, some close friends of the Institute, people who we've uh, had here uh, before and we think very highly of, from Ambassador Bijan Khan, a good friend of mine, Ambassador Katz of, uh, from Israel, uh, of course Tony Feinberg has been here many times, and a couple others to discuss one of the issues that I'm sure you've all read about and heard about, a lot about in the news, but one of the more thorny issues of our society and our time the spread of nuclear weapons, the spread of nuclear capability to nation states that might be involved in all sorts of different international pressures in their region from the sponsorship of, of terrorism to, to the touchy world affairs in and around the Middle East. If there is any part of the world more complicated than the Middle East, it would be hard to make that case, I think. So the discussion of whether the, the most recent agreement is helpful or beneficial or not beneficial, I think is one that in and of itself, the discussion of the issues, the discussion of the pressures, it will be instructive, informative, and hopefully will help guide us in the future as a, as a race of people, as a, as a set of nations around the world for, to deal with some of these extremely difficult issues. As I said, I think we have with us today some of the most knowledgeable, experienced uh, policymakers I've ever met in the room, and I'm really privileged to have them here with us. I'm going to let Professor Yona Alexander do some detailed uh, introductions, and then we'll jump right into it with a featured presentation. Uh, but I, I wanted to, if, if you hadn't already yourself been impressed, I wanted to impress upon you how, how wonderful it is to have uh, this level of cadre of people here to discuss these issues. Professor Alexander? Thank you again, uh, Mike. Uh, <coughs> before we proceed, I just want to remind everyone that this is a wonderful toy, but we have to know when to use it, and <laughs> since uh, we are being uh, taped, I would appreciate if you kindly turn this off, including myself. <coughs> uh, as Mike indicated, uh, we do have a, a very outstanding, that's a really ordinary uh, team uh, to, to discuss uh, the, the issue of Tehran's bomb uh, challenge and obviously there are some other issues and we'll discuss it. What I'd like to do immediately is uh, number one to express uh, my gratitude to uh, obviously the Potomac Institute for its uh, continuing uh, support for a very long time but uh, also to our uh, colleagues, academic colleagues, uh, particularly right here to Professor Don Wallace, uh, who is the chairman of the International Law Institute. Uh, we continue to cooperate uh, with um, the Institute on various uh, issues related to legal studies, and also the, the Center for National Security Law of the University of Virginia School of Law is co-sponsoring uh, our events, so we're very proud of that. 
So again, I would like to uh, say that the panel is going to proceed in a few uh, minutes with the keynote uh, speaker, the Honorable Bijan Kian. Um, as you can see from the details, the bios that were uh, distributed, um, is the highest ranking Iranian American to serve uh, several US uh, presidents and he has a very rich and distinguished uh, career uh, in government as well as the academic community uh, business and so forth and uh, we'll introduce him again a little bit later on. And uh, we have uh, Ambassador Norm Katz right here uh, who is currently the Minister of Public Diplomacy at the Israeli Embassy in Washington and he served uh, as an ambassador of Israel in Africa, in Nigeria, for example, Ghana, and so forth. Then Dr. Tony uh, Feinberg was a very prominent uh, physicist, and um, it's, it's really a great uh, pleasure and honor to have him uh, again. Uh, I remember vividly when we were in the, actually in the shelter underground in the Geneva dealing with this nuclear threat and so forth. And then finally, Dr. Emmanuel Otolinji, who is uh, currently with the um, Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington, D.C., and is a uh, very prolific uh, author. One, one of the latest publications is about the Islamic Revolutionary Guards and so on. And uh, before we proceed, I want to recognize our graduate students here, which is really a great privilege. Uh, Sharon, are you around? Okay, come up front and try to introduce yourself as well as the graduate team that are completing actually the semester very quickly. So why don't you stand up, uh, the graduates, some, some of the people already left, just introduce yourself quickly. Hi, my name is Stephanie Reeker. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin. Um, my majored in political science and international studies and concentrated in global security. And we are working with um, Al-Qaeda affiliate groups and um, research on uh, Northern Africa. Okay, next. Uh, well, louder, please. Uh, my name is Walt Osma. I just finished a master's degree in international relations from the London School of Economics, um, and I'm working here for the professor of continuing studies in Africa. My name is Sheila Davis. I just graduated from Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. Um, my major was international relations, minor in print journalism. Here I'm working on Nigeria, um, Syria, and Egypt timeline events. Hi, I'm Michael Clement. I'm in my second year. Thank you very much, and uh, we're very proud of uh, our uh, interns. And uh, the bad news is that they would have to deal with some of these issues uh, the next, not only next year or coming years, and uh, hopefully we can learn the lessons of the past, what worked, what did not work. Uh, now, before um, I introduce again the keynote speaker, I have some uh, <coughs> homework to do, first of all, to present the copy to you um, of our book with Mike Swetnam on, on the Al-Qaeda, and then this report on the Hezbollah that was uh, just published last week. Uh, now, I would like to give you also a copy. Thank you very much. If you want <laughs> to pass it on to Tony <laughs> and Emmanuel. Don Wallace, I think you have, you have the book, but you can have the Hezbollah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, uh, with your permission, what I, I really would like to do also in the interest of, of time is uh, to, to develop uh, a discussion. I know that several of our panelists, they um, have some other obligations. They would have to leave a little bit 
earlier. Again, the, the Honorable Bijan Kian, as I mentioned before, very distinguished. I, I think a public servant as well is activities in the private uh, sector uh, and so on. You, you have the details. I won't go uh, into, into it, but I think what is really important is to involve people who know the subject inside out, so to speak, because of their background, because of their many extraordinary contributions to national and global security concerns. So um, we ask the Honorable Kian to provide the background, the context to our discussion, and then we'll follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Professor. You Thank you, Professor Alexander. I'm very grateful to you and the Potomac Institute for inviting me today. And while being very grateful for that introduction, I'm very humbled. Uh, the, uh, I said uh, some time ago that uh, the burden of the responsibility uh, lowers one's head. And that's a good thing. It's a humbling experience to have served in positions of responsibility. You look back and think about decisions you've made and look forward to the challenges ahead and uh, try and learn. So uh, before uh, sharing my thoughts following the headline of the program on Tehran's bomb challenge, moving on to crossroads, roadblocks and roadmap to rapprochement. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about Iran and Iranians. Um, uh, if I'm repeating something you've heard before, please bear with me. Um, being an Iranian American, very proud of my heritage, I have to say that, uh, that uh, there is a need to recognize that Iran is a 2,500-year-old country that celebrated its system of belief 2,500 years ago with just six words and 30 letters, good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Iranians are descendants of Cyrus the Great, father of Iran. They're not descendants of Ayatollah Khomeini, father of the Islamic Republic. Iran is 2,500 years old. The Islamic Republic was born 34 years ago <coughs> when unsatisfied Iranians went to the streets and ultimately to the polls and said no to Iran and said yes to the Islamic Republic. Today, <coughs> young Iranians are not so happy with their parents. They believe that they got a deal that they really didn't bargain for. <clears throat> we are uh, looking at unhappy Iranian youth, 20-somethings, uh, who have no jobs, no hope for the future. And they're looking at a government that is more interested in helping Hamas and Hezbollah. And of course, you've all heard about parks and recreation facilities that the Islamic Republic uh, is building in Lebanon while the youth in Iran are expecting other help with finding jobs and a future. Having said all of this, I cannot help but observing the joy of young Iranians these days at the prospect of change. They're happy, and I... Uh, I see that, and I see that they've been told too long, for too long, that, that uh, the, the reason for their uh, ills is really, is really the sanctions by the West. They've been told for too long that all of the problems in the country have nothing to do with ineptitude of unqualified managers for too long that have followed ill-designed <laughs> economic policies that have really run the economy of the country to the ground. The combined inflation, unemployment at 80 percent, 
35% unemployment, <coughs> more than 40% inflation, a negative GDP growth of 5% or more, and a currency that uh, plummeted to worthlessness uh, levels. So the youth in Iran are hopeful that President Rouhani uh, is going to bring some change. They're hopeful that perhaps unknowingly President Rouhani uh, has uh, launched an Iranian press troika. We'll visit that later. But now that we have at least tried to separate the account of Iranians from their government, uh, let us take a look at Tehran's bomb challenge. It would be a fair question to, to ask why do we why does the West believe that Tehran is pursuing a nuclear bomb when Tehran has been insisting for so many years that they're not developing a nuclear bomb? So what is it that worries the West about Tehran's nuclear program? I think the answer to that question is fairly simple. There is a worry that nuclear weapons developed by Iran would fall into the hands of the terrorists. There's plenty of reason for that worry. Um, what would happen if Hezbollah, for example, got a few missiles uh, equipped with nuclear heads from Iran? The race to nuclearization is something that worries us as well. The Saudis are already talking to Islamabad, and the small countries in the Persian Gulf are justifiably worried uh, because of Islamic Republic's uh, imperial ambitions. And of course, on a no less scale, we are worried about the security of our strongest ally in the Middle East, the State of Israel. So I believe it's based on these and other equally worrisome prospects that President Obama announced on October 7, 2008, and I quote, we cannot allow Iran to get a nuclear weapon, and I will do everything that is required to prevent it. Now, I had the honor of working for President Obama, and I really believe the President meant what he said in 2008. I would very much like to believe that what took place in Geneva 11 days ago is consistent with that belief. But I'm having some trouble matching that clear statement with what is being advertised in Washington as a historic deal that will halt Iran's nuclear program. And of course, in Tehran, as you've heard, uh, it's being advertised as a heroic deal that has broken the painful chain of sanctions. Now, I really, I really have a hard time objectively uh, labeling what happened in Geneva a deal. Um, and then I'm having even more trouble labeling it as a temporary deal. <coughs> I see before me a complex joint action plan with a nominal six-month term, renewable by mutual consent, that has provisions in it that will take about a year to complete in theory. The trouble is, no one can tell with certainty when the clock starts. When this question was asked last week, our State Department spokesperson uh, answered the question like this. What she said was, well, first, there needs to be a technical discussion to take place after that technical discussion, there is a commission that's going to be appointed, and the commission will start working through complexities of working to agree on an implementation plan. And uh, I guess, she said, that's when the clock starts. So I figure a non-diplomatic answer to that question would have been, I don't know. So that's, uh, that's what I hear there. Um, so this is not the only myth that's associated with what happened in Geneva on November 24th. There are a number of other wonders. Uh, uh, this arrangement is not historic. Uh, Ten years ago in 2003, President Khatami of the Islamic Republic promised to halt the enrichment activity for two years, 
four times the nominal term of this uh, arrangement. So I, I wrote in, in an email to uh, Professor Alexander that, uh, you know, I heard somewhere that uh, one should not buy two copies of the same newspaper on the same day, and if diplomacy um, drives one to do so, that's okay. Uh, it's just difficult to expect that you would read a different headline on one of the two exact same copies. So uh, this is not historic. It's happened before. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> we have reasons to be skeptical. So the problem structurally <coughs> is that this arrangement is renewable in some aspects and not in others in practice. It's re renewable because if uh, all sides agree to extend it, uh, it can be extended. So that part is renewable. But when we go back and take a look at a very organized regime of escalating sanctions that have, I believe, have brought the Islamic Republic to the negotiation table, uh, it's very difficult to imagine that six months or eight months or even a year down the road that uh, perhaps some of the obligations by the Islamic Republic are not met and we go back and say, well, we're going to start escalating sanctions. I think that would create a diplomatic complexity. Uh, we would be faced with a serious question of, well, you're talking, there are disputes, why don't you just keep talking? And uh, it's going to look bad if we say, no, no, uh, you know, we, we see a need to escalate sanctions. So uh, that's a problem there. This, this regime of sanctions that have brought the Islamic Republic to negotiation table is, is not looking so, so stable uh, anymore. And of course, uh, there are experts who argue against the sanctions. They say, look, you know, 10 years ago, there were 160 centrifuges spinning in Iran. And with all these sanctions, we have now 19,000 of them uh, spinning. So I pause on that. And I say, well, you know, I have a problem because people are trying to advertise these sanctions as crippling sanctions. Well, I don't think they're crippling. They haven't been crippling. Look, they had 160 centrifuges. They have 19,000 of them. How could, be, how could we look at crippling sanctions? The uh, Islamic Republic Air Force is flying uh, Phantom F-4s and F-14s, uh, Tomcats. These are, these are old aircraft. They're still flying them. They're getting the parts somehow. Okay, maybe sanctions made it very difficult to to get chicken parts, but phantom parts are, are still obtained somehow against all of these so-called crippling sanctions. So uh, I, I believe what brought the Iranian economy down is really uh, the, the uh, uh, unqualified managers and ill-designed economic policies combined, of course, with the effect of sanctions. So right there, I would have to say, the Iranian youth have a good reason to be looking at some positives. When you look at President Rouhani's cabinet, uh, you're looking at uh, technocrats educated in the best universities, uh, some in the United States. I uh, heard that there are more PhDs in that cabinet than uh, many countries' cabinets combined. So. Uh, is there hope? Yes. Uh, can there be changes? Yes. What is the probability of that change? And this is, uh, this is where we start getting into discussion of crossroads. Uh, I believe Iran is trying to make a decision with the new administration. They're trying to ask the question, are we going to remain a revolutionary state? 34 years has uh, passed and the country is still in revolutionary stage. It has not normalized. They're asking the question, should we do that? 
Should we continue the advice of the Islamic Republic strategists that say, look, we need to be, uh, we need to be like Israel in many different ways. We need to be defending the rights of Muslims all over the world. They can make that route, they can make that choice and see where that takes them. That's the choice. Um, if they do, they would have to continue supporting Hamas and Hezbollah. And that's problematic. But if they choose to change and to say, we're a country with a young, talented population, we can do a lot to change things around and to be an active participant in the world economy and uh, reap the benefits. But that's not easy. And that's where we get into the roadblocks. For 34 years, there has been a system of exchange of security for legitimacy. The Revolutionary Guard and the paramilitary have provided security to the institution of Islamic Republic. The supreme leader, in turn, provided legitimacy. So he bought security with legitimacy. That configuration changed somewhat. It's still in place, but it changed somewhat after the summer of 2009. The amount of legitimacy the Supreme Leader had available to be able to buy security with went down dramatically. So the security apparatus came to the Supreme Leader and said, well, uh, I, don't see, I don't see the assets as large as you had before, so I'm providing security and I need to get paid, and that meant more political power. It meant more economic powers. Today, uh, there's no way to find out for sure, but I'm told that the Revolutionary Guard controlled maybe three-quarters of the Iranian economy. It's not so difficult for me to understand that, because I know <coughs> that uh, when you define a private sector, it has to be defined in terms of independence, and difficult to see that. Transparency International is ranking the Islamic Republic as one of the most corrupt uh, countries perceived by the people uh, on the streets, and, uh, and that's a roadblock. It's a challenge. Let's assume today that all of the sanctions are lifted. Tomorrow morning, we wake up, there are no sanctions. And let's say American companies start reaching out to their counterparts, uh, Chambers of Commerce are established and uh, work is going to uh, start. Well, we have a law called the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. makes it very difficult. The United Kingdom has one that's even more stringent called the United Kingdom Bribery, Anti-Bribery Act. How are we going to do business? So much has to change. How is the uh, Islamic Republic going to sit down with the Revolutionary Guard and say, you guys, uh, sorry, uh, things are changing. Uh, you know, you own all of these businesses and uh, you count it as a right to own all the government contracts. Uh, that's going to change because all these other countries uh, are now starting to trade with us and they expect to have fair competition. So you're going to have to sit back. What do we think the reaction of the, uh, the commanders uh, who have been used to having the luxuries of life? Not all of them, not all of them. And this is important to note because not all commanders of RGC are treated the same way. Some are getting all the luxury and others are running fast uh, to catch the last bus uh, late in the evening to go home. So uh, there, there are challenges, there are problems. Uh, but we think about these roadblocks and we have, to, we have to think positively. We have to allow some chance for change to take place because the alternative is not so attractive. Um, 
I often think about what is the Islamic Republic really up to? Do they really want to make a nuclear bomb and then weaponize it? And they have been developing very aggressively their intercontinental ballistic missiles. Do they really, are they really after such an aggressive posturing? And then I wonder, maybe, maybe not. Maybe that's not exactly what they want to do. Maybe what they want to do is to imitate, for example, <coughs> the, the state of Israel. They like to be able to have the label of NDNC on their program. Neither deny nor confirm. So they like to keep the world guessing. Do they or do they not? Is that a possibility? I think that's a possibility, but it's a dangerous possibility. Because when it comes to the moment of truth, let's say Hezbollah doesn't behave, and Israel decides to correct that behavior, what is Iran going to do if Iran continues on that path? That doesn't make the world a safer place. So we have to consider we have to consider these possibilities and look back at the behavior of the Islamic Republic. The Islamic Republic has been playing this game of cat and mouse. They say, we're not after developing a bomb, but we just have to do some work on plutonium development. And so wait a minute, I'm not a physicist, uh, but I guess remembering my eighth grade chemistry book, you don't need plutonium to light a light bulb. So why that? Why the heavy water reactor in Iraq? Well, interestingly, the IAEA inspectors are going to be there tomorrow or the day after, perhaps. And uh, I suspect they'll go there and, uh, uh, you know, while there's a very, very uh, uh, methodical structure to the arrangement, we see some fast action taking place. They're going there, they're going to look, and they're going to come back, and they're going to say, uh, yes, this is a heavy water reactor, but it can be changed to a light water reactor. We see all the signs here. It can very easily be changed. So I think that is going to be changing the taste and the weather in the conversations. But... Uh, Let's continue on that hope. And let's say that Ms. Maybe, maybe Mr. Rouhani has started an Iranian press troika. Maybe this PhD uh, composed uh, cabinet uh, is going to actually uh, uh, start battling with the theocrats in, in Iran. I see that as a very, very challenging road ahead not easy. I was looking at a photograph where um, the Iranian foreign minister, uh, Mr. Zarif, was, uh, was being offered at an event, he was being offered a uh, chafia to put on his neck, and the way he was looking at it, it was like, what is that? And uh, you can see that in the photograph. And then when he took it, uh, other photographs show that he put it on his neck, but he kind of hid it on their the uh, the jacket so so I can see I can see there there is uh, really a divide and that raises hope that maybe maybe there is a possibility it's not an easy one um, but change could be there so what do, what do we what can we do you know when we look at the people of Iran I see them these twenty somethings are our best friends, best allies, they want a better life for themselves. They're good people, they're talented people. Yes, there were inept managers uh, running the country before, but it looks like technocrats are coming. So the hope is not without foundation. Um, but what can we do? What can we do to help out, maybe? Can we, for example, take a, a very aggressive diplomatic posture of instead of being uh, confrontational, 
we try and put the uh, new Islamic Republic under some pressures, but different kind of pressures. For example, maybe we start talking about the dangers of the airlines in Iran. You know, the number of fatalities after the 1979 revolution compared to before has been just, just sadly astronomic. Thousands of people have perished in these, uh, in these uh, aviation events. Uh, and maybe what we can do is, is to be aggressive and say, you need to change the parts. You need to service this uh, aircraft. Our laws allow you. Why don't you do that? And, uh, and really uh, get closer to the people who are dying as a result of aging aircraft and, uh, and really they have nothing to do with support for Hezbollah or, or anything like that. So we could do such things. Of course, when we do that, we have to be very careful uh, because uh, uh, the thought of uh, Boeing parts finding their ways to Mahan Air uh, which is the official, uh, well, non-official airline of the Revolutionary Guard is, is a concern. We have to be very careful. But I think it's a lot easier to watch for those parts and where they go and look at these uh, uh, aircrafts uh, than it is to try and guess and see if a heavy water reactor uh, is being activated or it's a lot easier to do that than to uh, for example, measured the inventory of 20% enriched uranium. Yes, there is an arrangement to dilute that, to reduce that, but how do you measure dilution when you don't know where the base is? Uh, you don't know exact inventory. Uh, do we know the exact inventory? And if we don't know, how do we monitor this number going down? We don't know where the, the start is. So that's a lot more difficult than, for example, monitoring the parts and where they can end up. There is a need to change the channel if we believe there is a chance. We have to be careful. There is no reason for us to be able to place trust and confidence. There's been a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, less than honest conduct going on for years. We have no basis to be able to place the trust. The arrangement calls for a lot of that. I really, I really hope that things work as a result of this new arrangement. Uh, I have a difficult time convincing myself that the road ahead is easy. I have a difficult time convincing myself that this arrangement is, uh, doesn't look like it's making the world a safer place. I hope it does. I hope that uh, our concerns based on the past uh, are not applicable to the future. Perhaps uh, there's a need to change that channel. What are the chances of that? From my perspective, very low. I cannot honestly place a high chance of uh, an Iranian prestroika intentionally or unintentionally having been launched because of the real challenges that I see um, in the road ahead. So with that, I am honored to be on the same panel with distinguished scholars and colleagues, and I look forward to a conversation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, this is a subject that can use hours of discussions, but I'd like to stop here and thank Dr. Alexander and uh, continue our conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very kindly for your very uh, receptive uh, analytical assessment. Obviously, you raised some uh, many significant uh, issues related to uh, the risks and opportunities, I think, in the short term and the long term. And I, I would like to follow, follow up uh, with a opportunity to discuss some of those before we introduce 
our very distinguished uh, panel. You know, as an academic, I cannot resist footnotes. So I, I think <laughs> while you were talking, I took some notes and I just recalled, we tried to look at the, le the lessons of uh, history and in two days, in two days, on December 11, we're going to mark, I think, the 72nd anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And what kind of lesson can we learn in terms of uh, the strategies of the so-called perceived adversary? Maybe deception, maybe surprise, uh, and so forth. And particularly, uh, while you were talking about trust and diplomacy, I, I wanted to, to mention the famous, I think, observation by Will Rogers, uh, if I remember correctly, when he said that diplomacy basically is like bookkeeping. What does it mean? It means that we don't trust you, you don't trust us, and therefore we need a balance sheet to see where we are, what works and what doesn't work. Then I recall a very vividly a Persian proverb when I visited Tehran the first time, 1968, I think, that basically said, even, even with the strength of an elephant and the pose of the lion, I cannot say it in, in Farsi at this point, but I knew it, that peace is better than war. So in other words, you were talking about the, uh, the opportunities. And uh, th there is no question about this, but at the same time, as students of diplomacy and uh, international affairs, I also remember Machiavelli, when Machiavelli specifically tried to teach all of us that one must be a fox in order to detect traps, and one must be a lion in order to fight wolves. So with this uh, footnotes, I would like to open up and see if there are any questions, uh, the audience, on the remarks, and then we're going to move on. Yes, sir, would you kindly identify yourself for the record, and please? Yeah, my name is Patrick questions. Murphy, and I'm <coughs> sort of sort of retired, or semi-retired. Anyway, uh, my question regards Mr. I think this would be Ayatollah Khamenei. And he must have sort of approved what the new president has been doing, but that's quite a change from, from what the old president did, and he, was, he all seemed to back up Ahmadinejad. So can you comment on Khamenei's rule in the new, the new world? Uh, well, if I understand your question uh, correctly, you are trying to assess the veracity of Mr. Khamenei's support for the arrangement. Is That's that? Right, yeah. Is he changing much? Yeah. Uh, or a lot. Right. Well, a couple of a uh, couple of signs that we can read. Uh, uh, Mr. Rouhani, President Rouhani of the Islamic Republic, wrote to uh, Mr. Khamenei uh, and uh, sort of asked for some kind of a, a thank you note, and uh, and. Uh, Mr. Khamenei, in return, uh, produced a thank you note for the work uh, that the team uh, did in Geneva. So that's on the face of it. Uh, but there's a complexity there. There's a complexity of how enthusiastic Mr. Khamenei can get about <coughs> rapprochement. Just imagine you are the uh, a Revolutionary Guard commander who has many, many business interests. Uh, they're very fragile. Uh, you're, you're sitting there, change is happening. People are talking to each other. And, uh, and you go back to the Supreme Leader and say, Your Holiness, uh, should I worry about my business tomorrow? Uh, what should I do? Uh, and just imagine that conversation. I'm not suggesting that the balance of power has changed in such a way that the Revolutionary Guard commander would be able to dictate to Mr. Khamenei 
but it has changed somewhat. Uh, there's still a very, very delicate balance of power there. In 1998, in Orange County, California, there was an event, and there was an official of the Islamic Republic uh, um, who was unhappy with some of the remarks that I had made. And uh, he said, in, in an upset tone to me, he said, you don't, you don't understand. You don't understand. The Islamic Republic is like the internet. There are nodes that are interdependent and yet independent. So you have to understand that. It's not like taking this node out, that node out. So uh, throughout the years, I've been thinking about that. Your question asks about that very delicate balance of power. So I hope I've answered the question. Thank you. Uh, any other? Yes. Mr. Leonard Oberlander. Leonard uh, if we go back in time to the, the uh, time of the hostage taking and holding the hostages, uh, there were two different perceived uh, goals there. One was the administration's perception of it at that time, trying to figure out what was it that Khomeini wanted from the United States? What could we give him? What, you know, and there was negotiating going on the offering. The other perception, which I think was more accurate, was that Khomeini didn't want anything from the United States except for the United States to demonstrate some uh, behaviors that could be labeled the great Satan, and that the United States was wrong, they may be clumsy, but the purpose was to unite the Iranian people under Khomeini, the various factions, into the future. Is, if that's accurate and you hold that uh, as, as correct, what lessons could be learned from that to apply to today's negotiation situation? You know, your question is a very interesting question because you're, you are looking back, looking at the history. The trouble with the history, when you go back 50, 60 years, is that the United States-Iran relationship is very much like the tapestry, the Iranian carpet. It's difficult to explain the complexity of design and the interrelations and the, uh, the repeat of, of designs and then uniqueness. It's not easy. There are a lot of myths. If you go back, August 1953, something happened in Iran. Uh, there was a prime minister uh, that got into uh, a disagreement with the king. Uh, he pushed the king out and then uh, he had a lot of support from the clergy the clergy unplugged the support. At the same time, there were a couple of <coughs> intelligence officers, and you know, intelligence officers uh, have a tendency to sometimes uh, make things a little, little bit more, more exciting than, than they are, and that's what happened exactly. Those two uh, gentlemen, Kim Philby and Kim Roosevelt, wrote a lot of things, <coughs> and then, and then the Iranians claimed that CIA removed a democratically elected prime minister of Iran in 1953. Now, how many times have you heard that state? Now, how many times have you asked the question, is it true? Is it true that uh, Iranian prime ministers were never elected? Mr. Mossadegh was elected, but not as prime minister. He was elected as a member of the parliament. He was appointed as a prime minister. The law, as I understand it, called for the appointing body being the king to have the authority to dismiss the appointee. I've been an appointee. We serve at the pleasure of the authority that appointed us. But there was a law that says the parliament has to consent to that. Well, there's a little complexity. There's a little complexity. He dissolved the parliament. So there was no parliament to consent to that. So was, was it a coup? Does it meet the definition of the coup d'etat? It doesn't matter. The popular belief is the United States did it. And then in 1998, our Secretary of State, Dr. Albright, uh, in, in good intention, in an intention to 
soften things and uh, she apologized on behalf of the United States for any role that the United States uh, may have had in that. I'm bringing that up to just show you one complexity. To this day, that event is on the list of grievances of Islamic Republic. And the Islamic Republic says, you, you have to do something about it. Of course, the list is very long. The downing of the commercial airliner by uh, USS Vincennes uh, is a serious issue. Uh, and, uh, and there are other things. But you go back to that event. Why did it happen? Uh, what was it that the Islamic Republic expects the United States to do? I, I have a, a humble theory. Uh, I think all the Islamic Republic of Iran has been wanting to do all these years is to simply say this, look, Washington, I know you had a real good friend, you were buddies, you sold a lot of aircraft and military tools and all that, you, you had someone who was your ally, he was your friend, but he's gone. I'm the one in charge, and I'm here to stay. Accept us, deal with us, and most importantly, help us be legitimized, help us be respected. By whom? By our own people. Because they know what happened. They know. Islamic Republic came with a promise that did not deliver. The Islamic Republic, as a theory, died the day after it was established. The whole new thing started. So that's the historical perspective. I think Islamic Republic is very interested in receiving signs of acceptance, of respect. You know, they said it themselves. They said, uh, do not talk about sanctions, talk about uh, respect. The, the words actually rhyme in, in a lot of ways. Uh, they said, don't talk about tahrim, talk about takrim, which the second word is respect in a very, very uh, elaborate way. So I believe those calculations still stand, but they're very complex. What the Islamic Republic expects from the United States is not truly well understood in Washington. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, insights. Um, because our clock is ticking, I, I have to move on to our other uh, panelists with your permission, and then we'll come back to the discussion. Uh, it's a great, uh, again, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Norm Katz, Ambassador Katz, as I mentioned before, in addition to his very distinguished um, <coughs> diplomatic uh, work um, in uh, Europe, uh, in Africa, in, in the U.S. I'm, I'm delighted that um, he was uh, educated at Hebrew University uh, in Jerusalem, where I had the um, privilege to teach for many, many years as well, and also as a member of the school in Kibbutz. <coughs> Cabri, um, where I spent a little bit of time a million years ago. At any rate, um, I, I think we, we really need some clarity uh, in terms of the uh, Israeli perspective on this uh, particular uh, issue, because after all, um, Israel and Iran and Saudi Arabia and the others, they are present in that particular neighborhood. And uh, the question is uh, whether they're going to cooperate or they're going to, to have a uh, continuous uh, conflict with very serious consequences, not only for the region, but the entire international community. So, Norm, why don't you come up here? And I know you have to leave also earlier, so we'll have a couple of questions later on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Yona. Thank you, Ambassador Kiran. It was fascinating. And thank you, all the members of the panel and all the guests. It's a great uh, honor to be here today. And I would uh, focus on the Israeli perspective. And from an Israeli perspective, when we look at the Middle East today, uh, we see so many burning spots and so many issues that are of top importance to Israel national security. But if I have to look through that smoke, that is covering the Middle East, Iran will be the top concern of the State of Israel. That will be the main issue, and all the rest of the issues that are important will be at second place. 
Now, when we speak about the Iranian regime, we can have a large variety of concerns, of grievances, uh, of uh, problems that we identify with that regime. We can speak about repressive nature. We can speak about involvement in world terrorism. We can speak about hegemonic ambitions in the Middle East, subversive activities against some of its neighbors, especially Sunni, uh, uh, in Sunni environments, supporting other groups in other countries in order to establish a, a strong presence and influence. The will to change world uh, balance uh, um, and, and having more role for uh, the kind of Islamic interpretation that Iranian regime is representing. All this is true, but from an Israeli perspective, the military nuclear program of Iran is the major threat. And that's where we are focused on in order to prevent that threat from being, uh, trans uh, being translated into reality. And before I'll go a little bit deeper, I just want to make two statements to make the issue very clear. Israel believes that this issue of military and nuclear Iranian plan can be solved, and we prefer that it will be solved diplomatically. We prefer that it will be solved diplomatically, but we look at diplomacy as an end to achieve goal. And here I'm going to speak a little bit about some of the differences that we have, and some of them were public, with our major ally, the United States. It's true that we have a common goal, and the common goal is preventing Iran from acquiring military, uh, 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 a, a military uh, weapon. But we expand it, and we would like to prevent Iran from having military and nuclear capacity. And it's not exactly the same. It's not exactly the same because we look at the capacity as the ability of Iran in the future to build bomb at will. Not immediately, maybe, but at will. And therefore, the problem is maintained if Iran has the capacity to build a bomb. When we were speaking about Geneva, we made clear that the agreement that is about to be achieved in Geneva is going to be a big mistake. And after it was achieved, we said that it is a big mistake. It's important to understand why we said that. And to be fair to the American perspective, the American perspective was very clear. They said it's a preliminary agreement. Basically, it's to buy time to negotiate a comprehensive agreement that will satisfy also the security needs of the State of Israel. The American basically wanted to push the pause button and to say, let's freeze the situation that we will have more time to negotiate. That is the American perspective. And when they went to explain the program publicly, they were not trying to justify the agreement as good agreement, because it's preliminary, but to justify the need in patience in order to achieve a better agreement. This is the American a fair assessment, I think, of the American perspective on the Geneva Agreement. Our perspective is a bit different. We believe that the preliminary agreement is building a corridor. And this corridor is not necessarily reversible. The agreement dealt with some aspect of the military and nuclear program of Iran, but not with all aspects. It was dealing only with the enrichment uh, uh, part of the military and nuclear uh, program of Iran, and it didn't cover all other aspects, technological aspect of weaponization, of, of, uh, of detonators, of uh, warheads, of ballistic capabilities, and so on and so forth. And to a certain degree, it freezed the situation. It didn't take out capacity to enrich uranium. It maintained the massive block 
of low enriched uranium in the hands of Iran, so basically the capacity to enrich it in the future is there. And it gave to the Iranian, it gave to the Iranian a kind of acknowledgement de facto <coughs> in the right to enrich. And I won't go and analyze the, uh, the text, but you can go and find it in the text. And if in the United States people explain it differently, we have simply to listen to how the Iranians are explaining that. That's how they see that agreement. And de facto, in the interim agreement, it's all there. What else the agreement did wrong? The agreement, in our perspective, is weakening the position of the P5 plus one to negotiate when they will come to negotiate the future comprehensive or permanent agreement. It weakened it because of two issues. One, because it relieved the pressure from Iran. It's true, and again, it's true what United States is, see, is saying, that the sanction relief is very limited. And in a way, it's very <laughs> controlled. But economy is not only about numbers and figures. It's about psychology. And there is now a different psychology. The psychology inside Iran is that sanctions relieved and will be, there will be more relief. So the internal pressure that maybe you hinted about uh, when you described the will of the Iranian people, maybe for a change, is somehow satisfied. The regime doesn't feel the same urgency as it felt before. The regime came to the table, to the negotiating table, to relieve pressure. Maybe it won't save the Iranian economy, because as you mentioned, it's a failing economy. But it will buy time. And time is everything to regime, that its main, one of its main goals is to stay in power. What else it did? It reversed the psychology of all the people that are not part of the sanction regime, but are waiting on the line, sitting on the sideline, and waiting for a change. I urge you, just do a Google search on Iran sanctions. And you'll see, uh, people are speaking, would like to come, whether oil companies will come, banking system. Some of the sanction effectiveness is that groups or bodies or organizations that are not part of the sanction believe that the sanctions are real and are going to be increased, and therefore they didn't go to do business. This psychology is reversed. Now, another reverse in psychology happens. Now the Iranians will come to the negotiating table with less pressure, and the P5 plus one will come with more pressure. They have to achieve an agreement, the best agreement possible. And remember, the goal is not to achieve the best agreement possible. The goal is to prevent Iran from having the capacity and the capability to have military and nuclear uh, 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 weapons in the future. But they will come weaker because they have to achieve an agreement, and the other side can play it better. That's why it weaken, we believe that the Geneva Agreement is a bad agreement, because it's weakening the position. We believe that there was no need to go into an interim or preliminary agreement. If Iran feels the urgency to negotiate, let them negotiate. The other element that we believe is that sanctions uh, the best guarantee of the P5 plus one, the best guarantee to prevent war. The sanctions took years to build until they put the necessary pressure and come to a critical mass that forced Iran to go to the table in order to relieve this pressure, keep the pressure on. More than that, Besides not harming the architecture, psychological and real architecture of pressure, put more pressure in your toolbox. You don't have to use it immediately when you are negotiating, but you have to keep it within your toolbox because the other side sees that. We need to understand Iran mastered the technological capability to enrich uranium. And when they came to the table, it's important to them to maintain that in hand. 
And they didn't cross some red lines that were set, including by our prime minister. You all remember this cartoon of the bomb. But they developed mechanism to bypass that red line. That's why the 20% that people mentioned now, the, the uh, uh, transforming that into oxide, it, it's not really relevant. It's equal to a few, to something around three weeks of enrichment. Because if you know to enrich to 20, you know to enrich to 90%, which is the military grade capacity. And you can do it, you don't have to go through the station. You can take the 3.5 or the 5% and enrich it to the right level. They develop also a plutogenic track, the uh, heavy water reactor in Iran. All these will give them and secure them the ability in the future to build a bomb. So they got, as we see it, a kind of a dream deal. They go, because it's not part of the Geneva Agreement, they go and develop the other components of the military and nuclear program, the technological, weaponization, whatever. And they suspend and maintain what they get. And they have the ability later on, because the right was recognized, maybe to use it. We, we don't think that in the interim time you will see a major violation of Iran, of the interim agreement. There is no reason to put that and jeopardize these achievements. We need more sanctions to be ready and to keep the pressure, and that pressure can keep them along the negotiating table. They didn't cross the red lines before because they were believing in the military option, credibility. Credibility means two aspects. A, the willingness to use the force by somebody. It can be Israel, it can be the, the, a combination of the P5 plus one. And by the ability of this military might to be used and be successful. So we have to focus now on Geneva is a fait accompli to a certain degree. We need to focus on what will happen next and how we use that time to achieve a permanent agreement that answers the needs of the international community and answers the needs of Israel. And we believe that the major component is, enrich is still the enrichment capacity of Iran. We have to roll it back and dismantle it. We don't oppose that Iran will have nuclear uh, capacity for peaceful use. You don't need an enrichment program for that. Canada has a nuclear capacity, uh, uh, peaceful capacity, but they do not enrich the uranium. You don't need that. So we said that that's supposed to be the goal, to roll it back and to dismantle that capacity. If that won't be done, and an agreement that keep that in the hands of Iran, the reality that we'll find ourselves, not immediately, but after a while, if agreement is done and sanctions are being released, then Iran at will will have the ability to reverse its decision, like North Korea did. And then there will be no options in hand of the international community to see that Iran is uh, uh, in compliance. They will have only two options. One is to go to a kind of preemption, use of force, or to do nothing and to live with containment, which I remind you, at the very beginning, by all leaders, including the American president, containment is not an option. But that will be the reality. People will say, OK, that will be the reality, but then we'll act. And we believe that people that say that really means that. But we know how difficult it is to translate that will or that understanding into a real action. We've seen it in Yugoslavia, and we've seen it in Rwanda, and we've seen it in Syria, and we've seen it all around. Democracies rightfully are reluctant to go to war. And then the default is doing nothing, is containment. That's the threat as we see it, and that's why we say that at the moment what we have to focus is on rolling back and dismantling the capacity of Iran to enrich, that any permanent agreement will deal also with the other components of the military nuclear program of Iran, 
and uh, the world has first to see that the architecture of sanction really is not harming by strict following what is happening there and to see that everything is controlled and secondly by developing more tools to pressure Iran. You want to have them in the box, keep them in the box. But you need to have them. And Iran need, the Iranian regime need to understand that the psychology of the P5 plus one is not in change. They are sticking <coughs> to the real goal and not seeking a quick agreement that will put aside the issue without solving the real problem. Uh, I will stop here, but I want maybe one more word about things that are seen from the Middle East and how different they are from maybe the United States. Our Prime Minister said and repeated it several times that if all countries in the Middle East that usually has huge differences among them are saying and thinking alike, it's worthy of paying attention to that. The American team in the Middle East today is weak. And the American team is made of members, of players, that not always get along with one another. Turkey and Israel and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf state and Jordan and even Egypt are all part of the American team. The American team has a, internal problems and weaknesses. But now they feel much more weak. They feel weaker and they feel much more threatened. And that's something that is worthy of uh, listening. When America look at the global situation and the need to stabilize, uh, uh, to stabilize the Middle East region. And I know that there are all kinds of thinking that maybe Iran is really a stabilizing force. Maybe they are bad, maybe they are not uh, nice, uh, it's not a nice regime, but at least it's stable when you compare it to Syria. They stabilize Syria, uh, they can uh, stabilize other countries, they are stable for themselves, they are not collapsing by domestic upheaval. But that is a wrong perception. That is a wrong perception. And we need to think about stated stated goals of the international community, for example, preventing uh, proliferation. It's not me that I'm saying that argument. It's the American president that mentioned it on the week of Geneva, signing Geneva, that more proliferation, nuclear proliferation, is bad for the United States, is bad to the world, and bad for peace and security of the world. But some of the consequences are leading exactly there. I stop here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Noam. I, I know that you uh, <coughs> that you have a very tight uh, schedule. Would you have time for one question, maybe? Yes, I have one or two. I can take. Uh, oh, okay. All right, uh, Dr. Kumar, please. Can you get him the uh, mic? A short question. Well, thank you to both the ambassadors for excellent presentations and very insightful. Um, I just had one question, which may not be directly related to WMD proliferation, but in terms of the relaxation of sanctions against, uh, well, kind of a SOP to, to uh, entice is, uh, Iran to curb its nuclear program, uh, what, what effect do, do both of you think it would have on A, uh, Iran's support to Hezbollah, and B, on Iran's involvement in the Syrian conflict, because obviously Hezbollah has diversified away from Iranian support into a, a, a nexus of criminal and terrorist financing. So its reliance on the Iranian state, per se, may have been reduced. So, so do you see these sanctions serving purposes other than helping uh, or enticing Iran curb its uh, nuclear ambitions? Thank you. Well, thank Sanctions uh, on Iran were put not only because of the nuclear program, uh, because of its support to terrorism, because uh, violations of human rights, because of its support to Syria, uh, because of uh, uh, weapons transferring and so on and so forth. Uh, I don't think that 
these sanctions are being discussed now. The major bulk of sanctions that we are discussing are the sanctions that were put on Iran by the Security uh, Council of the UN. Uh, and later on followed by individual country sanctions of uh, 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 countries that see the, the Iranian problem uh, alike around this uh, nuclear military program. So the focus is, uh, is on this type of sanctions and not on the others. I don't think that we are going to see Iran you mentioned perestroika, and we won't see perestroika in the strategic understanding of the Middle East of Iran. Uh, it's a massive investment in Lebanon. It's a massive investment in Syria. And they are not going, from their own perspective, to lose that uh, uh, investment. And in fact, I can see from their own perspective that they see some gains in the new situation. If people start seeing Iran as stabilizing force, stabilizing Syria, for example, or stabilizing even Lebanon through a control. Uh, uh, that's something that sometimes people in the world can see as preferable to uh, nation collapse or to the rise of Al-Qaeda groups, etc. Israel's perspective that on, on these issues is very limited. We don't think that we have the ability to change the current of events in, uh, among our neighbors or in the region. We follow strictly what we see as security immediate concerns to us. That's why Israel is not taking sides in the war uh, in, in, in Syria. Yes, we give some humanitarian help to people that are coming. But we made it very clear that if strategic game-changing weapons will go into the hands of terrorists, we will do whatever we can in order, in order to prevent that. And that can be chemical weapons that now are being handled through a, through tra a different track, but also other game-changing weapons like cruise missiles, Yachont missiles, or, or, or anti-aircraft missiles. Okay, so Ambassador Kiyan, do you want to respond to what, what was said? Just, just, a, just, a quick, uh, just a quick addition that uh, I think it's important to think about. You see the Islamic Republic of Iran celebrating the, uh, the success of the premise of the right to enrichment. And that's why I like to go back and, and really think about the comments made by the ambassador on this issue. Uh, see, I believe if Article 4 of NPT is going to be even questioned, that puts the United Nations Security Council sanctions in serious question. Uh, the right to enrichment and the language of NPT and, and you know uh, colleagues can comment on this but but the language is written in such a way that uh, you know Secretary Kerry can confidently say there is no such right in the language and he's correct in saying that and then Foreign Minister Zarif uh, can say uh, you know Americans interpretation serves their own purpose uh, we do have the right the right has not been uh, clearly taken away, therefore uh, it is a right there for us. This is very important. So when we sort out the sanctions regime, uh, this issue of Article 4 uh, reference and the right to enrichment, they're celebrating. They're, in Tehran, it's a done deal. The tete accompli, it's already done. The right to enrich has been recognized. You listen to Mr. Rohan. Listen to uh, you know people talking in Tehran. That's what they say. It's a stop. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll come back to some of the other issues. I know you have to leave uh, very soon, and I'm going to call on my colleague, uh, Professor Don Wallace, who has also another engagement, but is very patient. And uh, would you like to make a few comments uh, from there? As I've often said, I'm just a law professor, I'm not an expert, and I've listened to this, these two presentations, and they're really very impressive, obviously. We've learned an awful lot about Iran and Iranians, and we certainly learned a great deal about the Middle East and Israel and Israel's legitimate concerns. My observation is maybe a little bit more skeptical about our speakers than uh, I, maybe I should be. Uh, but several points. One, we are where we are. It's no good going back to where we were 10 years ago, why we are where we are today. 
Um, secondly, I think it's almost an issue of psychology. I lived in the Middle East, and the psychologies are very different. Um, and I would use the word trust. I wouldn't trust the Iranians uh, further than I can throw this table. I'm not sure I trust any state. I mean, states have interests. Uh, but I think one thing is important, we should trust ourselves. I think we're too skeptical about ourselves. We all talk about the breakdown of trust in authority in the United States. I'm assuming that Secretary Kerry is not a fool. He's a lot taller than I am. I expect <laughs> he's, he's at least as intelligent. Um, I also think, just to go to mechanics of negotiation, and we have the interim agreement, maybe we shouldn't have had it. Um, I do think you under, as I, I've lived in the Middle East, I lived in Turkey, and my job included Iran. The Iranians are an extremely ambitious, able people. They have their drawbacks. Um, one purpose, presumably, of this uh, interim agreement is to develop some kind of confidence building, it's a cliche, in Iran itself. Rouhani has to, uh, has to also do a lot of selling, and I don't know what the Supreme Leader uh, has in mind. Uh, I know nothing about the manipulation of sanctions. The purpose was to get us here. Whether it's good to strengthen them further or not, I don't know. I mean, I must say that I share, a, you know, the United States is tremendously devoted to Israel. And the Israelis who have their doubts about us do themselves a disservice. We have been so loyal to Israel for so long. Not to say Israel has not a great deal for itself. Um, and this tendency in Israel to think that we're going to somehow abandon Israel or sell it down the river is just not right. Uh, one final point. Uh, Tom Friedman wrote, I thought, a rather cynical column in which he said, let Netanyahu rave as much as he wants. It's good for us. It's sort of the, you know, remember Nixon was always, no one could tell whether Nixon was going to go bananas or not, uh, that the United States is under this pressure from <coughs> Israel, its friends in the Senate and elsewhere, and we'll tell that to Rouhani. If you don't make a deal, uh, it's going to get a lot worse. Final point. What is the alternative? I mean, I say we're all totally devoted to Israel, but what is the alternative? I mean, is it Masada? I mean, I don't, want, I don't want the United States pulled down because Israel just cannot bring itself to overcome its distrust and fear. What is the alternative? Uh, you can let the Israelis bomb the Iranians. I don't think that's going to help very much. And of course, the truth is that uh, things have gone in a very bad direction over the last 40, 30, 20, 10 years, not from the view of Israel, but from the view of a lot of people. So I see no alternative to where we are. And I think it would serve an awful lot of people well to have a little bit more trust in themselves of course, with respect to the Iranians, it's going to be trust and verify, as Ronald Reagan said. And I just, if I were an Israeli, I'd be more comfortable than Ambassador Katz, who's obviously very able and lucid, might lead us to believe that Israel is. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm sure that yeah, I, our colleagues there have something to, I would like to, to say to one say. more. No, you have be just before I, I know you have to go and okay. uh, Yeah. First, thank you for, for, for your comments. I don't think that we lose our confidence in the United States. I don't think that there is a real crisis between Israel and the United States. On the contrary, I think that we have very strong relations that are at the peak of all time. Mm. And I think that that's why we can have that sort of discussion. And the discussion uh, uh, is something that we believe is important, also the public part of it, because we believe that there are alternatives, positive alternatives. That's why we say that if we keep the pressure on, we can keep the Iranian around the negotiating mm -hmm. table. They need to know that there is more to pressure. And maybe they can yield and give more than what you don't expect them to give. We believe that the pressure brought them here and it can bring much more and a much better deal than what some here in America thinks that it's possible. There is no mistrust in, uh, in, uh, in America and Israel. Uh, there is a sense that the direction is mistaken and there are very narrow margins of error. Uh, and let's play the if, and you know we are not supposed to play the if game. But let's say that all the bad stuff that I said uh, uh, is going to uh, materialize. Iran will become a threshold nation and, and, and then one day will try to break out into a bomb. We need then to have the capability to operate. And I, we are very proud that the American president said that 
Israel is capable and has all the right to defend itself by itself. That's the basis of the QME uh, uh, system that created and is at the very basis of the alliance between Israel and the United States. That United States take care of Israel and allow it to build its capacity to defend itself by itself against any threat or combination. Uh, we think that we can achieve much more and do it better. We think that Geneva was a mistake and that we can correct the mistakes of Geneva. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, I know I you have to Sorry, go. I apologize. Uh, Ambassador Kiyan, you want to make a comment on that and then we're going to move on to uh, other families. Well, I, uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity, Dr. Alexander. Uh, I hear uh, Dr. Wallace, uh, I hear you. you. You would like us to stay with the diplomatic line. You know, let's pretend we have a good first step. Let's not talk about the concerns. Let's not aggrandize the shortcomings. Let's not talk about the reversibility of commitments on the Islamic Republic side and the fairly permanent positioning that we've placed ourselves into. Uh, I hear you. The trouble with this is the sense of temporary measure on this. The trouble is, it's okay, this week we can celebrate the diplomatic talk. I have no trouble with that. The trouble is, how long is this mood going to last? And what are we going to ask ourselves a year from now uh, with respect to the actions we took and the attitudes that we maintain? Are we going to say that was the right thing to do? We celebrated uh, the temporary happy mood, uh, not thinking about what we would face next month or next year? Or would we say uh, we would have been better off uh, really in a truly respectful conduct? I believe truly respectful conduct is not to call each other's fools or or uh, assume that people are not smart. Truly respectful conduct is to understand that, as you said, the Iranians are very good at the game they're playing. I mean, look at the results. I said it on, uh, on uh, a TV program broadcasted to Iran the other day. The day the uh, arrangement was announced that politics is not a sport, but if it were to be soccer, and if I were to comment on that, I would say first half time, three to one advantage, Iran. <laughs> and, uh, and I also said that it's very difficult with that kind of result in the first half time, very difficult to see a win in the second half time for the P5 plus one. Uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the match would be uh, called an equal match, perhaps it could. It could. But it's important that we figure out where we want to go. If we really want to take the diplomatic route, then we have to be super aggressive on that. We have to take the route that says, look, we, we, want, we want to trust that there is possibility of change, and we want to take actions as if you are trustworthy. We are going to, to remind you that you need to take care of your youth, you need to look at your programs, you need to take a look at corruption in the country, look, Transparency International is ranking you as one of the most corrupt nations. Is that what you want? That's the reputation that we, we should push the Islamic Republic along the diplomatic line on these issues more, more. Other issues notwithstanding, I'm not suggesting we drop everything. I don't think so. We don't have that luxury. As you said, we are what we are. But if we are going to be diplomatic, then let's be really, really aggressive on diplomacy. That's, that's my two cents on that. More than two cents. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think, again, in the interest of time, I would like to move on to our other distinguished uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Tony uh, Feinberg, as I mentioned before, very, very prominent uh, physicist. And uh, he had, um, I think, two decades at least uh, of experience uh, with uh, with the government, uh, different uh, agencies um, on uh, security, uh, energy, and aviation, and so forth. 
And uh, also academically, um, I, I'm very pleased that he participated in many of our activities uh, as well and contributed to studies of the OPA, um, which provided guidance to uh, Congress uh, in terms of technology and technology policy and the threat of terrorism and so on. Tony, would you mind to come up here? Uh, okay, can I just talk from here? I think it'll be easier. Well, uh, we, we have to ask our director. Do I have to move this uh, away? Is this okay? Okay. Great, thanks. Fine. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks very much for inviting me here. Uh, you are not only too kind in your introduction, you're inaccurate. I am not prominent at all. I'm a <laughs> physicist who's been sort of uh, noodling around national security issues in, uh, in Washington for, for a while. Uh, frequently with you, as a matter of fact, uh, to, to, to good effect, I think. So I'm oh. proud. <laughs> to good effect. Uh, I, I uh, overall, let me say at first that I agreed with, I think what was the first point Mr. Kian said was that this is not a deal. You can call it an interim agreement or an accord, but there's not, not a question yet whether this is a deal to support or not. I disagree with Ambassador Katz is that in the assertion that this is a very bad arrangement, it's far too early to say whether it's a good arrangement or not. However, I would, uh, and, and uh, let me break at this point and refer you to two articles, one in the Post uh, op-ed piece by David Albright on Friday, and David Albright, as some of you may know, is a technical person who is uh, uh, using satellite and other information, has uh, been fighting the non-proliferation issue for quite a few decades, and is by no means a pushover. And another article I would refer you to is by James Acton, uh, the Carnegie Institute, looking at these uh, at these two, at this agreement uh, or accord or interim settlement or whatever. And uh, I came to the same conclusions they have. And that is that in the first place, it is not a bad thing, not only to freeze the Iranian program but to roll it back. I strongly disagree with Ambassador Katz that it's irrelevant if you dilute. Uh, to, uh, 100 kilograms of 20% enrichment. It is not a big thing, and he was absolutely right. It only makes a difference of three or four weeks or so in how long it would take them to break out. However, uh, the, uh, the assessment of Albright is that if the Iranians wanted to break out and made a decision to do that today and, uh, and, uh, const and produce enough uh, highly enriched uranium to make a weapon, they could do it probably within a month or two. This at least prevents that from getting any closer, and the, the purpose I see of the interim agreement is not just a pause in the psychology. The purpose is so that we don't get rolled the way some people think we did in North Korea, where we negotiate with North Korea, and at the same time they're building up their ability to produce nuclear material. This allows a negotiating period to take, and negotiations to take place without them being able to push closer in principle. Uh, it is also more than enrichment, and it's, it's uh, more than just uh, even rolling back 100 kilos, which is almost enough to make a nuclear weapon for an early nuclear state. It is not an inconsiderable uh, concession for the Iranians to have said, half of this 100 kilograms we will dilute back to 5 percent, and the other half will turn into oxide. It's pretty easy to get from the oxide back to the gas. And it, but it, it also takes a while, and that's why it's three to four weeks longer rather than allowing them to get closer. So it's very much in the, in the interest of the West and the rest of the world to have this pause. Uh, there are a few other issues I'd like to point out from a technical point of view. And just to give you an idea of numbers, uh, when your stuff is enriched to 3 or 5 percent, 3 to 4 to 5 percent in 235, you have already used about half of the energy, or you can also read that as time, you need to get up to the 90 percent weapons, uh, weapons level. Once you're at 20 percent, you're roughly at 90 percent. It's very quick to go from the, from the uh, 20 percent up. So it, again, if, if this is their main stockpile, and I think we have other reasons to think that their stockpile of 20 percent is not much larger. If this is their main stockpile, it is a great advantage to uh, downblend it so that they would have to start again. Now, there, there is an issue with what are the real atten in intentions of the Iranians now. And uh, Professor Kat, uh, Ambassador Katz uh, was focused on 
apparently considering Iran to be a monolith and the same decision processes and the same peoples had been going on until the election and after. And perhaps he's right. I am not an expert this, on this. I don't know. However, uh, my reading, far away from everything, is that four years ago, uh, when there were elections, Khamenei, uh, in some way or other, intervened in the process, or his people, or his revolutionary god allies at the time intervened in the process, and somehow Ahmadinejad, uh, sorry, it was, four, it was eight years ago, uh, somehow Ahmadinejad made the runoff, and then uh, running against Rafsanjani, who was quite unpopular at the time, did very well. He barely made the runoff, as I remember. Uh, was that an, uh, an uh, intrusion of Khamenei? I don't know. In 2009, the four years ago, uh, when you had this election that to many people looked fraudulent. And I don't know, again, if it really was or not. There are arguments on both sides. However, what is indisputable is that there were a lot of people in Iran who thought that was fraudulent. And there was a very nice uh, analysis of that election by uh, Professor Ali Ansari of the University of uh, St. Andrews in Scotland, uh, making, it, making a very good case that it was extremely unlikely that the, uh, that the results were as quoted. And the, the, the fundamental reason to divert a little bit is because he looked at the different parts of Iran and what the results that were reported were, and it turned out to be almost uniform across the country. In, in other words, where, where, uh, where Musavi came from, and by the way, he's still under house arrest as far as I know, where Musavi came from, he didn't do much better than in most of the rest of the country. Uh, it was almost certainly a fraudulent election, in my view, from a long distance. This time, Something is different, and what was different, I think, was the sanctions and the, and the parlous state of the economy in, in Iran, and, and the fact that there was, in many ways, maybe a, a, certainly a more suppressed, but even perhaps a greater discontent and disaffection with what was going on. Now, uh, again, I, I don't know the numbers, but I believe that the sanctions ha did reduce oil uh, revenues by almost a factor of two, and that probably has had two some... Half, two and a half million barrels e per e day e to e about one million. So even, even more. So that make the, the sanctions at least made it harder for them to make up their incompetence and inefficiencies in the government. It did have an effect. So when uh, Rouhani was allowed to run in the first place, which was an interesting question, that indicated to me that uh, Khamenei had decided that his old buddy from the old days, Rouhani, was going to be okay. Now, we don't know whether or not this is all a conspiracy and collusion between uh, Rouhani and, uh, and uh, uh, Khamenei to uh, uh, pull, pull the blinders over the eyes of the West. And I think all we can do at this point, and again, I agree with Mr. Kian, is to give it a chance. I'm not sure I give it uh, as much as 50%. I'm not sure I give it as low as 5 or 10%. But there may, there may actually be a chance that something has changed because of the effects of the sanctions and the great discontent and unhappiness of the people. Maybe Khamenei has decided that he doesn't want to be known as the person who let the Islamic Republic collapse and who destroyed the, uh, the economy of his country and, uh, and the status of his country for a long time. Perhaps he's made a strategic decision. We don't know. We have to say. And even if he has, however, there's the other thing. He is not a lone actor. It is an internet. I, I'm quite sure of that. There are many, many nodes and, 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 uh, vir and ghost nodes, virtual nodes. Uh, how many may have made this decision? The uh, Revolutionary Guards may have some people in there at a high level who may not like this decision, and who certainly don't like this decision very much. And the question is whether they would be able to mobilize any support to derail it. I don't know. But um, my bottom line is because of the, the technical aspect of at least we've stopped, we've frozen and rolled things back three to five weeks, whatever it is, uh, it's probably worth trying out to see if uh, Rouhani and later on Khamenei can be brought to a reasonable agreement. And then one has to go into some a bit uh, more details. Uh, I do agree with Ambassador Katz that there's a question of, uh, of the military part of the Iranian program. Uh, in my view, and in David Albright's view too, and he's done some great work on this, uh, they were doing explosives testing at a place called Parchin, 30 kilometers southwest of uh, Tehran for quite a long time that looked extremely like the kind of explosives testing you would make with conventional explosives to see if you could compress, if you could uh, uh, do your, your implosion device in a, in a uh, be uh, 
accurate and well-timed way that you need to acquire nuclear detonation. This kind of work really doesn't have any other applications. It looked very suspicious. And in the last few weeks, uh, maybe a few months, uh, people have been cleaning up that site, been taking the topsoil off and doing all kinds of interesting things, uh, perhaps with a view that eventually somebody from IAA would come and take some samples. There's some questions there and a whole bunch of past lies and deception of the Iranian regime, perhaps under the previous uh, administra administration, more than the current one. Of course, the current one's only there recently. There were violations of agreements with the IAEA regarding the announcements of the facilities at Natanz and Fordow, where uh, the enrichment is being done, particularly Fordow. Uh, they, the uh, Iranian government at the time said, oh, we had a, we had a perfect right to uh, sign up to the additional protocol and then and then back out of it, which provides additional uh, safeguards that the IA is, has uh, imposed upon uh, uh, the uh, client states, the customer states, uh, over the last couple of decades. Uh, we have to ask, in some final agreement, that, that, that those questions have to be probed a little bit. I don't know if it's if one can achieve a decent final agreement, I don't know if it's necessary to rub their noses in their past lies. And that's a, that's a political and diplomatic question people will have to answer. Maybe uh, if one understands the extent of their, of their previous military program, or perhaps current military program, maybe uh, it's worth passing over that if one can impose enough safeguards. The fact that Iran has, uh, may come out of this with some enrichment capability at the 3 to 5 percent level uh, is somewhat disturbing to me, and I am somewhat concerned about it, as Ambassador Katz is more so, because it allows them in the future to break out. However, the game with the uh, safeguards regime in the, uh, under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the game is to try to arrange your safeguards, your monitoring, and your understanding of what is going on in the place, such that if somebody decides to break out, they will have to make a major announcement, and there will be enough time for the rest of the world to react. Uh, perhaps in a very forceful way before they're able to do the screw in the last screw on the last weapon. Incidentally, a parenthetical point: uh, getting one bomb is probably not enough because you don't even know if it'll work. The North Koreans' first bomb did not really work very well. It was worse than a fizzle. The numbers I've seen is 0.3 to 0.5 kilotons. If they get one bomb, they have no idea if it'll work at all. They would have to get two or three, the way the Koreans have, six or seven. And by the way, the Korean, uh, the Korean way, the way we treated the Koreans uh, in uh, 2002 to 2007 was uh, to insult them a lot and to make all kinds of threats and uh, then to say, well, if you don't make a strategic decision to uh, give in to our demands, we're just not going to talk to you. And Kim Jong-il said, thank you, Jesus, and he took the plutonium that was in his reactor there kicked everybody out and made several weapons. Uh, it is not a good idea to speak loudly and carry a small stick. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had it better. I mean, he got it from the Wolofs in Senegal. Uh, but uh, there are people around here who apparently thought it was perfectly okay to try to play the schoolyard bully and walk away. And the result is that the Koreans now have a, have a nuclear deterrent. And we're in a much worse position now than before. If we can intervene in Iran in some way, and Iran I know is a very different state from North Korea, a very different situation, but if we could in intervene and negotiate with them in some way to keep their hands off uh, enough highly enriched uranium to make a bomb will be far better than we were in North Korea when we let the guy take his, uh, his six to eight to ten weapons worth of plutonium and play around with them. So I think we ought to c consider that. What is the alternative? As I think Professor Wallace had said, what is the alternative? And if, the, if, if you really think it's better not to talk and just to threaten these guys, you better uh, be prepared down the road for what you have to do. And it may be easier in Iran for many respects than North Korea, but it's not going to be pleasant for anybody. Uh, one final thing, if one puts one's optimistic hat on and hope that in the future, and it probably will not take six months, if there is any final agreement that's acceptable to us, it would probably take more, 12, 18. Maybe, maybe that could lead to a situation where one might explore the possibility of a Middle East uh, weapons of mass destruction free zone. It's possible, and it's something that even the Iranians and the current Israeli government have been sort of playing around <coughs> with over the last few years, talking about a meeting in Helsinki, and then it didn't work, and each side was annoyed at the other's behavior. 
I, I think in this case Israel was really right. Uh, but uh, and another point, since Syria has removed its chemical weapons of mass destruction probably or is removing them, maybe that might give together with an accord here an additional impetus to try to push forward a little bit in that area. I'm not all that optimistic, but I think the results of it could be so positive that uh, one ought to keep that in mind. Anyway, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Tony. I think you obviously raised many questions. I know that members of the panel would like to um, make comments, and the audience, we have a few physicists there, and uh, we have to be particularly careful. Some of them are nuclear physicists. At any rate... I used to be, yeah. Well, <laughs> Once you are a nuclear physicist, you're always a nuclear physicist. Now we're going to move on to like Jewish, uh, yeah. our last but not least <laughs> uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Emmanuel Olegeni, who is, uh, as I mentioned before, a senior member, uh, a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of uh, Democracy, very prominent as well, and um, uh, prolific. And um, I, I think I would like to get some of your comments, and then we can develop some, some discussion. Go ahead. Would you like to come? No, up no, here I'll, stay, I'll stay I'll here, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, speak, uh, I'll speak very loudly, and uh, I'll keep my very big stick under the table for the time yeah, being. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity, and, uh, um, and uh, I'm very honored to be uh, speaking with, with such distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, I... Uh, uh, I am neither a nuclear physicist nor an Iranian, um, so I, I will bring something else to the discussion. I spent uh, six years in Brussels uh, prior to moving to this country, um, and I am Italian by birth. And uh, you know, Brussels and Italy have a few things in common. Um, the way people drive is one. Um, <laughs> the quality of the food is another. And uh, a, a very uh, a disproportionately high percentage of fiscal evasion among uh, its tax contributors uh, uh, is, is the third. Um, I say this because uh, um, one of the things that I have uh, been spending a lot of time doing in the last few years is while my colleagues at FTD increasingly uh, you know, squeezed their, uh, uh, their brain and invested their, their intellectual efforts in thinking about uh, ways to uh, improve uh, the sanctions regime, I played the red team. How do I cheat the sanctions? How would Iran undermine, circumvent, and bypass these measures? And I say this because uh, it's quite clear to me that uh, you know, the sanctions were extremely effective on one level and not entirely foolproof on another level. And the agreement uh, um, has uh, significantly relaxed the effectiveness of those measures. I mean, the Ambassador Kian made a, a very interesting, two very interesting points before. He said, on the one hand, that uh, you know, with 30-something years of sanctions against airplanes, spare parts, uh, the, uh, the military, the Air Force in Iran is still getting to fly their planes. I mean, I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't aspire to be an Iranian Air Force pilot um, for a variety of reasons, but they're still flying. And on the other hand, he said the sanctions have been so effective that thousands of Iranian civilians have, have died because their civilian fleet is, is falling apart. Now, I have some familiarity with the way that the Iranian regime procures its uh, spare parts. They buy them here, by the way. Um, they use a number of front companies in London. The front companies are known to the US government. There is actually a very entertaining correspondence between the, the, the Department of Commerce and their representatives in London. You know, Mr. Islamian, we have reason to believe that you are actually working for Mahan Air because you know, your company that is not called Mahan Air has the same address and the same phone number and the same fax number and this and that and the other. And Mr. Islamian is still there running the same company. He's owned by another company in Germany, which the Department of Commerce knows about. And, and this is happening, okay? So I think that the issue of whether they work or not really says a lot less about the effectiveness of the sanctions, especially with the example of the airliners versus the jet fighters, and more about the priorities of this regime. The regime doesn't care 
the thousands of civilians will fall off the sky because the aging civilian planes um, are not well serviced. And by the way, uh, at least insofar as travel abroad, the Iranians have a choice. They can fly Lufthansa, they can fly Air France, they can fly a lot of other airlines. And by the way, the internal domestic airlines are actually getting new planes. Uh, Keshem Airlines, the airline of Babak Sanjani, just bought uh, six uh, Airbus uh, 320 uh, through Onur Air, a Turkish airline which is owned by an Iranian regime frontman who operates from London. So they're not having as many difficulties as we think. But the sanctions, uh, while they may have not uh, impeded entirely uh, Iran's efforts, or uh, they're not completely blocked Iran's efforts, they have made it costlier, more difficult, more complicated, and, and much riskier. To say that because the Iranians are achieving or acquiring some of this technology, means that the sanctions uh, are therefore useless. It's a bit like saying that because since the beginning of time, civilization has made it uh, wrong and illegal to murder and, and steal, and yet there are thieves and murderers around, therefore we should decriminalize both activities because obviously all of our efforts are failed. I mean, even though we know that thieves are still thriving in, in the world, we do not therefore dismantle our alarm systems and, and uh, you know, Put or put their codes on the website themob.org uh, in order to uh, you know somehow uh, you know f find a new way to live together with thieves and murderers. The point is that there will always be somebody with an incentive to break the law, and the question is how effective are we in implementing these sanctions? Now the sanctions have been a tremendous uh, tool and yet an enormously difficult thing to achieve. Uh, Ambassador Kian used the soccer comparison. As an Italian, I, I understand soccer, and uh, I like the comparison, but I think that the marathon is a better example. I'll tell you why. Because what we're seeing now is that the lead runner in the marathon is maybe a couple of miles from the finish line, and it took an enormous effort to take the lead and, and lose the group behind, and victory is at hand. It's still very difficult. You know, marathon is a very inhuman thing. It, it takes its name from somebody who ran a very long time and then died because <laughs> physically it was too much. So, you know, it's a strenuous effort. It, there's no guarantee that we're going to cross the finish line. And what happens two miles from the finish line? The lead runner stops to wait for the adversaries to catch up. This is what the agreement is doing. And let me run you through the... Um, you know, two points here. One, who benefits? And again, you know, we spoke mainly about the United States and its best ally in the region, Israel. Let me remind you that outside the continental United States, there is a whole world that, unlike the United States, did not implement sanctions against Iran for in, within living memory, okay? The United States business community has so far more or less adjusted. It has come to terms with the fact that Iran is a commercial black hole. You can't do business there unless you go through a whole sorts of complications, OFAC licenses, this, that, and the other. But when it comes to Europe, Asia, the rest of the world, even Canada, until a few years ago, everything could be traded. And I mean everything. Yes, there were dual use restrictions, uh, you know, export controls, but basically trade was thriving. I was sitting in Brussels in 2007 when the European Union was tentatively looking into very small sanction measures to insert under, you know, the UN Security Council banner. And the mood was, you know, 25 million, uh, billion uh, euro a year, i.e. 40 billion dollars a year worth of bilateral trade. There is no way we're going to give that up. And even if we did, the Chinese and, and everybody else will step in. And it was extremely hard to persuade the European Union to give that up. Um, and by the way, it was a success. And it, they were wrong. You know, there are things that the Chinese and the Russians and others can, can make. Although, you know, if you have to choose between um, a Mercedes and a Lada Jeep, I think you'll still go for the Mercedes if you have the money. Um, but, you know, there are things that they can still. But there are other things that they can't. 
since the European Union imposed its own autonomous sanctions, the entire LNG sector of Iran, the liquid natural gas sector, which was in, at its beginning, has collapsed. A week before the Geneva second round of talks, the National Iranian Gas Company declared bankruptcy. Now, does that mean that sanctions were ineffective? I don't think so. It doesn't mean that sanctions achieved the goal for which they were built, namely to force Iran to comply with six successive Security Council resolutions saying suspend all enrichment activities, including R&D, which the Geneva interim deal doesn't seem to have achieved. So now that we were two miles away from the finish line, and we had invested all of our energies getting the international community to pass six security uh, national in the uh, UN Security Council sanctions uh, resolutions um, under Chapter Seven. We got the Europeans to go against their commercial interests and give up about 50 percent of the trade, the legitimate trade that was going on with Iran. Now that we got in six months since, uh, actually less, five months since uh, U.S. Uh, secondary sanctions against the car industry were passed, we had gotten 50% of the car industry losses on the books. Um, we had brought the, the natural gas sector in Iran to a halt. We had made their currency practically collapse. We had helped uh, inflation reach unprecedented levels. We had aided the collapse of the Iranian economy to the point where President Rouhani himself in an interview last week said that there were three days left in some parts of the countries of supplies of essential goods. Uh, it, he admitted that it would take 16 years for the government to repay the debt and balance the budget caused by the depreciation of the currency and so on and so forth, by their own admission. We got to that point and all of a sudden, without getting irreversible concessions or compliance with the UN Security Council resolutions and NPT obligations of the Iranian regime, we said, we will give you sanctions relief. And the administration and its European allies are saying, it's only worth $7 billion. It's not very significant. The problem is as follows. First. No sanction has been lifted yet, and yet the real has appreciated by 5%. The uh, Tehran Stock Exchange has soared in the sectors that will be affected by sanctions relief. So one of the things that I did with one of my colleagues on Monday, 25th of November, was let's take a look at the petrochemical sector in the Tehran Stock Exchange and see how much it's worth. And on Monday morning, the, actually before the agreement. So we looked at uh, uh, you know, Thursday before the agreement. It was worth approximately $25 billion at the current exchange rate. We looked at who owned it. One third was owned by the Revolutionary Guards and half was owned by the government and the rest was private, including uh, at least one company that could be traced back to the Supreme Leader. Since the agreement, the value of that sector has gone up to almost $32 billion just by virtue of the stock exchange going up and the exchange rate of the currency. So we have handed them a $6 billion surplus capital gain without even starting to relieve the sanctions. Now, take just that example. Look at the agreement that talks about all of the related services, the financial channels. You want to talk about the financial channels? There is not one single bank in Iran, including the non-designated one, that is not in one way or another either under control of the IRGC or of the Supreme Leader or the government. There's no such thing as a private, transparent banking institution in Iran. So what the sanctions will do is they will award mainly those elements in the regime in control of those sectors which are the most invested in the proliferation business. So we are giving an award, a relief, to the worst elements of the regime, the ones that are least inclined to give up the toy. Okay, so we are giving them an enormous benefit. On top of that, we're giving them all of the related financial services and commercial services. And third point, 
we have removed the fear that all of those companies and businesses in Europe and in Asia had to violate U.S. sanctions. As we speak, there is an Austrian delegation of business people boarding under the ages of the Austrian-Iranian Chamber of Commerce to go to a four-day visit to Tehran. On Monday in Brussels, the Iranian-Belgian Chamber of Commerce organized a one-day seminar with one of the senior diplomats of the Iranian embassy there to talk about new business opportunities under the, you know, the new atmosphere. And these are just two examples in every capital of Europe and in Asia. These things are going on. Why? Because the market bets six months down the line on what it expects it will happen. And the expectation now is a rollback, a relaxation. And therefore, they're all running to get a contract, even if they cannot implement it now. And that will drive up the price of everything. It will increase the value of dealing with the Iranians. And once you have all of that in place in six months' time, it will be extremely hard for the European Union and the Chinese and the Russians to agree with a United States claim that the Iranians have violated the terms of the agreement and therefore it's time to put the sanctions back. You cannot put Humpty Dumpty back together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I, I think, I, I think uh, you obviously triggered a lot of uh, issues that everyone would like to participate, but first, uh, in terms of protocol, and Ambassador, I would like to ask you if you have some comments. I appreciate that. I, I really much rather if we go to the floor, but I just say uh, very quickly that uh, in 1979, people I worked with gave me a t-shirt and the back of it it said I'm Italian <laughs> and uh, you can guess uh, why that was and the utility of that t-shirt uh, considering the times I'd just like to say uh, a few words about uh, something you mentioned uh, you uh, mention the, yeah. what well, I just like to say a few words about uh, something that Ambassador Katz uh, mentioned and then Dr. Otto Lenghi also talked about that. that is capacity to enrich. This is a very important question. And uh, what I wonder about is, uh, you know, I think about that marathon runner, uh, which is an excellent example, and I thank you for that. Um, Just quote me if you use it again. I will do that. <laughs> I will do that. I will do that. But, you know, I think about this. So you have a very talented uh, population. You have a university in Tehran called Sharif University. Uh, it's very interesting that in 1995, the uh, winners of Stanford University's mathematics tournament, um, the number one went to Sharif University graduate. The number two, all the way to number five, went to Sharif University graduates. So you have this population that has accumulated <clears throat> impressive capabilities. When you talk about capacity to enrich, you're essentially talking about the ability, the talent. How do you roll that back? Is it practical? Is there any way? When you talk about capacity to enrich, is it really practical to do that? Second question is, talking about the marathon runner, so uh, Dr. Feinberg says, if you have enriched to 20 percent, uh, by the way, I really don't know uh, when I hear that we know everything there is to know about everything that goes on in, in Tehran. I wonder. I, I don't know. Do we really? I mean, how that, that confidence can be very dangerous. We, it's, it's very, very costly if we are not so sure. So the capacity to enrich deals with that talent. That talent is there, it cannot be rolled back. The advantage of the Islamic Republic being able to keep the world guessing that NDNC label, neither deny nor confirm, that is just amazing value to them because their imperial ambitions, hegemonic desires in the Persian Gulf, all of that depends on that role. And the West is asking them to give all of that up. So it puts us in a very, very, very weak situation, 
all things aside because what we're asking them to give up is really a whole lot. And I wonder if that is not exactly designed that way because we've talked about soccer, we've talked about marathon, but there's another game that is a bit more relevant and that is chess. So I, I think I stopped there. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm sure that uh, our panelists want to respond, but let me ask uh, Eric first uh, to ask a question. The mic is coming. Thank you. Uh, Eric Fussfield, B'nai B'rith International. Uh, Emmanuel, you, you um, started to answer uh, near the end of your presentation that the question that I wanted to ask. I, 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 I re I'm very concerned um, for reasons that you identified that because it was such a struggle to bring our European allies um, in line with international sanctions, that as we start to scale those sanctions back, it's going to be very difficult, even more difficult, to reverse course with them. So in light of that, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know what you make of this argument that the administration continues to advance, which is that now is the wrong time to increase sanctions because this um, will cause the Europeans to peel away. It's almost the opposite, it's almost the inverse of what I consider to be reality. Increasing sanctions will cause the Europeans um, to fall off uh, because out of some sort of sense of fairness that they feel because Iran has come to the table and therefore we need to reward them. But uh, what, what do you, is there any validity at all to this argument the administration is making? How do you feel about this? Manuel, you want to respond to that? Well, I, I, th I think I, I've made myself uh, fairly clear. Uh, I don't think that uh, there is any any wisdom uh, in uh, in assuming that once you've taken the sanctions away, uh, you can quickly put them back together. Um, uh, the um, the sanctions relied on um, an element of fear. Um, you know, European companies were afraid to break the law of the land in their own jurisdictions. And on top of that, when the laws of the land in their jurisdiction allowed certain types of business nevertheless to be conducted, they were afraid of incurring punishment from the United States through secondary sanctions. And that fear is gone. The fear, you know, as, you know, business people will look for business opportunities. And again, to go back to, to um, my heritage, which is uh, you know, slightly, you know, around, around the, the 2,500 years, um, th there used to be a competition between Rome and uh, the Parthians, but then a, a few things got in the middle. Um, and the, the Romans did lose, yes, that's, that, is, that is true. But, uh, but uh, you know, the Greeks saved the day also. So, uh, and, and then the Romans conquered the Greeks, and the rest is history. Um, what, was the, what was the point that I was trying to make? How about the Chinese? Well, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's leave the Chinese aside for a second. But the, the point I wanted to make about Rome is that there was a famous uh, emperor who uh, uh, was, taken, uh, was, was deprived of the pleasure of destroying Jerusalem because he had to go and, and take over Rome. Um, and after he destroyed Jerusalem, uh, uh, he proceeded to endow the, the empire with, uh, with uh, public urinals uh, for a charge. And um, when protests erupted, uh, the emperor, whose name is Vespasianus, uh, and the toilet, the public urinals in Italy were always called until they were removed recently, Vespasianus, uh, in, in his honor. He used to say, pecunia non olet which in Latin means money doesn't smell. And business people will look at Iran and will not smell anything bad about doing business. And by the way, forgive me for, for making this point about you know, the anti-bribery legislation, please. You know, 25 billion euro worth of trade in 2009, you think that the anti-bribery legislation was a huge impediment? I promise you it wasn't. Um, and that's always been the case. And so as soon as the fear factor is removed, 
the orderless uh, um, dimension of profit will be the driving factor. And once that kicks in, on top of the fact that you know, we have spoken about the alternative, the governments in Europe themselves have actually been slightly more invested in this venture of stopping Iran for fear of an Israeli military attack than for fear of an Iranian bomb. If you ask them really in sort of a one-on-one in the privacy and comfort of, of a, of a microphone-less room, they will tell you that they're much more concerned about the former than the latter. So now that the fear is gone for the business community, and the fear of the alternative is still very much there, six months down the line, if there is no agreement and the Iranians are stalling and, and um, there are you know, significant violations, the reaction of the Europeans will be, I'm sorry, we will continue to negotiate, or a bad deal is better than the alternative. That is what is going on. And you know, I knew that things were going bad when I saw that the longest sessions in Geneva were not between Iran and Lady Ashton, but between the P5 plus one, uh, the P5 plus one among themselves. So that will be the game, drive a wedge between them. uh, And when things go south, I promise you, the ability to put back together such a tough and effective regime of sanctions and, and, and legal restrictions will be off the map. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony, you have any comments at this point? Okay. Ambassador, you will have the last word because, again, the clock is ticking, and I know there is another session here very soon. And uh, clearly, it's the beginning of dialogue. We'll continue at some other point. So please, Mr. Ambassador. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ottolenghi and Dr. Feinberg for the education that I received today, and, and okay. yourself, Dr. Alexander, and also the questions uh, from uh, friends in the audience. Uh, uh, what I would like to say, uh, you know, I'm not sure if the last word could be spoken today. Uh, we have to wait for that. Um, do we have uh, a good deal or a bad deal? Time will tell. Uh, it doesn't look so good. I, I said on the TV program that if this was an aircraft, I wouldn't get on it yet. Uh, so that's uh, that's how I feel uh, about it. Uh, I was talking to a dear friend of mine who was uh, going to be here. He had a lunch uh, commitment, Dr. Amatsia Baram. And I asked him, I said, Amatsia, what do you give a chance to this so-called prestroika? And he said, 5%. So I, uh, I know why he said that, and he doesn't mind me repeating this. Uh, but uh, I also cannot place a very high chance. Uh, uh, I think what, what happened in Geneva on November 24 is pretty much not reversible. It's a done deal. What has happened cannot be reversed. There's a lot of psychology. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, business reactions that is in place. I think we need to think about what we do. I think Dr. Wallace said the last word before he left by saying, we face what we have. It is what it is. Now we have to see what's the best for the world uh, and all parties, uh, a, a win-win if it's possible. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Uh, you know, uh, the other question, if I may, uh, as a footnote, I mean, you, you spoke <laughs> about the, the match, the football, and marathon. Maybe we have to consider a ping pong, you know, <laughs> match between the antagonists. At any rate, we cannot, you, you're absolutely right, we don't have the last word. And we still have to keep the different options open on the risk and opportunities. I can assure you one thing, that we are going to have the opportunity to continue this dialogue very, very, very soon. And I want to thank you for your contribution, the panelists, the audience, and uh, we'll be in touch with you because we're planning to have a publication of this particular session. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.